When you're very young, every new food is a whole new experience, perhaps to be treated with curious caution. When you're a little older, you may be more adventuresome. In fact, conquering some foods can even become quite a challenge. Of course, there are always foods that we like at first bite, while others kind of have to grow on us. But food is for all of us. It's something we share in common no matter what age we are. Actually, food has become a part of our social world as well as a part of our pathway to good health. So food is important in many different ways. In fact, important enough that we should take a more serious look at the food we're eating today. We're usually pretty good about feeding our children the right foods as they grow, but what about ourselves when we get into the second half of our life? Should the food we eat be any different then? And if so, how and why? This is Jack Shelley from Iowa State University asking you to take a good look at your food habits today. They're probably not much different than they were 10 or 20 years ago, if you're in your 40s or your 50s now. Once they're established, our eating habits don't change a great deal during our lifetime, and most of us are eating pretty good food. And we drink the 2% milk. We drink, I think, more milk now than we have in the past. Again, I like buttermilk to drink, and I like it in cooking. I use milk in cooking, like for puddings and one thing or another. I usually use the cheddar, the, the sharp cheddar, for many things that I fix. I use milk in cooking, one thing or another, but I, I, I never was a big milk drinker. We always have ice cream in the deep freeze. I like ice cream with soda pop or something like that with it. Yes, we've got lots of milk products in our shopping carts today, and more and more of us are picking out the low-fat type. I guess you might say we really like milk. Oh, I eat all kinds of meat, roast beef and, and fried steak and pork chops and all, all kinds of meat. We use chicken quite a bit too, even uh, the parts of chicken. I like fish if it doesn't taste fishy. We have eggs more often for an evening meal than we do for our breakfast. I do use nuts, the nuts in the base. Why, I eat more peanut butter than the kids used to. The old saying, it's meat that makes the meal, seems to still hold true. We're eating more meat per person today than we ever did. He loves oranges, orange juice. Almost every noon, we have at least a half of an apple apiece. Yes, I could eat tomatoes, I think, three times a day. I like nearly all the vegetables and fruits, too. And then I put in carrots, potatoes, celery, uh, lettuce. We always have lettuce and uh, cabbage. Most generally potatoes of some kind and fruit. All kinds of vegetables. Frozen when I could get them. I much prefer a frozen vegetable to a canned vegetable. So in most shoppers' carts, there's a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, frozen, canned, and fresh. And in general, they're fairly easy on the budget. I buy all of the bread that we use, the white bread, or uh, whole wheat. I probably have this cereal or something for breakfast. During the week, I, we usually have cold cereal. But on weekends, we have a cooked cereal. I eat most anything. We have a balanced meal, at least one balanced meal a day. When you work, you don't always balance your meal, but we manage to have one balanced meal a day. Some crackers and some cheese. And the shopping cart always holds something in the way of breads and cereals. They make your money go further, and besides, they're good food. Yes, people who are buying these kinds of foods are enjoying some good eating, but you can overdo a good thing, especially after age 40, when perhaps you're no longer as active as you used to be. Nearly half the women in this age group are overweight, and men also get a little heavy with the fork. About 30% of us are overweight too. So what difference does this make? Well, it depends. It depends on how long we want to enjoy this second half of our life. Figures show the major cause of death in this country is coronary heart disease, taking its toll in the 40 plus age group. And studies have shown our diet is partially to blame. Dr. David Krzyzewski of the School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania tells the results of one such study. People whose cholesterol was high were at risk. People who smoked too many cigarettes were at risk. People whose blood pressure was high were at risk. People who had two of these were at greater risk than ones who had one. People who had all three of them were in real bad shape. Now, I think the operative word here is the word risk. 
because being at risk is not the same as having it. So this means that there are people with high blood pressure and high cholesterol and heavy cigarette smokers who live to a happy old age. And there are people who do none of these things and have a coronary. But in general, your chances are worse. Dr. Chesky has written a book on cholesterol, and he points out that even though it's been pegged as a risk, cholesterol is necessary in the body. Sadly, cholesterol is not a foreign substance. It is present in every cell in the body. In fact, we don't really know what it's doing in the body in general. There's an awful lot of cholesterol in the brain, so that the term fathead is really descriptive. <laughs> there is a lot of cholesterol in the skin. Now, in the brain, people think cholesterol may be a um, insulating material. In the skin, it seems to be a lubricant. It is the parent substance of a lot of hormones. The sex hormones come from cholesterol. Hormones such as uh, cortisone come from cholesterol, so it's really needed. The real problem is that some people seem to have too much of it, and uh, we really don't know exactly how they get too much of it. Some, of them, some people have too much because they eat too much. Mm -hmm. Some people have too much not because they eat too much, but because they can't get rid of what they have. And these people all have to be sorted out because the treatment has to be different for every one of them. And how do you sort out those who have an especially high cholesterol level? We asked that question of one of our local doctors. Just like your family doctor, he sees many a patient in his office every day. Well, cholesterol is a solid, waxy substance, but of course in the blood, it's in a soluble form combined with proteins. And this combination of cholesterol and protein is called a lipoprotein. And to find out how much of it you have in your blood, we take some blood from your arm vein, technician puts it in a tube, separates the serum from the blood cells, the serum is then treated with an acid to break the protein and cholesterol bond. This is the cholesterol which is separated from the protein is then treated with other chemicals to produce a color. And the color density is related to the amount of cholesterol that is in the tube. It is compared in a colorimeter with known cholesterol quantities. And the result is then reported in milligrams per cent. This is the number of milligrams in 100 cubic centimeters of blood. And what's considered a normal cholesterol level? There really isn't any normal, because there is a continuous relationship of cholesterol level to the incidence of new heart disease. And even at an excellent level, such as 200 milligrams per cent, there is more heart disease in developing than there is in somebody who has a level of 150 milligrams per cent. So what damaging effect does cholesterol have in the body when it comes to the coronary heart problem? Well, here is a normal coronary, artist's conception of a normal coronary vessel. And you'll see that the inner lining is thin and smooth. Now here is a coronary artery from a 40-year-old man who died of a heart attack. And you'll see that there's been a deposition of a great amount of this cholesterol material in the artery wall. And it's narrowed the opening, so it's very easy for a clot to form and block the artery off. The coronary arteries are the arteries that supply the heart muscle itself. And there are two large ones on the front surface of the heart, and there's one on the back surface of the heart. When this occurs, the patient has a heart attack, and he may have sudden death, or he may recover slowly from this insult. Those in the medical profession have been concerned with this problem for years. Nutritionists have been too, but so far there's no complete agreement on a clear-cut answer to the problem. Everything in the diet seems to be important. There's no question that the amount and type of fat is important, but the amount and type of carbohydrate is important. There are people now discovering that the amount and type of protein is important, and our recent work has been showing that even the amount of fiber, which is the what your mother and my call roughage, the non-nutritive portion of the diet may also be important, which again gets us back to square one because it's how all these things interact and how they interact within the individual, which I think makes the major difference. We've asked Dr. Bill Runyon, who teaches nutrition here at Iowa State University, to point out some of the do's and don'ts for those of us whose doctors have recommended a low cholesterol diet. Specific do's and don'ts will vary with the dietary program recommended. However, we can get an idea of some of the general recommendations by looking at the material we have here. 
One should select lean, low-marbled meats, trim all visible fat before cooking, limit consumption to a total of six ounces per day, which can be consumed all in one portion or divided into smaller portions and consum consumed at more than one meal. Fish or poultry should be selected for at least two uh, days per week because they provide good quantities of polyunsaturated fat. Shellfish, such as shrimp and liver, should be restricted to no more than twice a month because they contain high amounts of cholesterol. Because of the cholesterol, eggs should be limited to a total of four per week, or if eggs are being consumed in baked products, or it is suspected that they are being so consumed, the total visible egg intake should be limited to two per week. In the dairy products, one should ch choose low-fat foods, such as cottage cheese in preference to the cheddar type or hard cheeses, skim low-fat or buttermilk in preference to whole milk, milk in place of cream, ice milk in place of ice cream, and imitation dairy products should be avoided unless it is known they are made with polyunsaturated fats. In food preparation, the oils or liquid fats should replace a portion of the solid fats. Soft spreads should be selected in preference to the hard spreads, and if possible, one should look at label information and see what kinds of fats are present and in what proportion. Do not be misled by the term vegetable shortening or vegetable fat. Vegetable fats may or may not be uh, saturated depending upon whether they have been hydrogenated and upon the plant source. Avoid chocolate products because chocolate contains saturated fats. Convenience foods and commercially prepared pastries should be avoided unless it is known they've been prepared with polyunsaturated fats. I would like to stress that these recommendations for, are for individuals who have to be concerned about cholesterol and fat intake. They are not to be misinterpreted as indicating that if cholesterol co intake is reduced and polyunsaturated fats are eaten, everything will be fine. One has to keep in mind that uh, this should all be done in moderation. And I think it's helpful to keep in mind the four basic aims of these recommendations. They are one, to reduce total cholesterol intake, two, to reduce total fat intake, three, to shift the pattern of fat consumption to favor polyunsaturated fats, and four, to keep total calorie intake under control so that a slender silhouette will be maintained. That's what's being recommended today. But as Dr. Krzyzewski points out, with new research coming along, the recommendations may be changed again in the future. People often say, well, you know, why is it that in 1952 the American Heart Association suggested one diet and then 10 years later they changed? It's not that they got dumb or that it's just that new data appeared. And this is a very rapidly developing field. And as new things appear, we have to change our thinking. Research is going on right now on the Iowa State University campus regarding the cholesterol concern. Perhaps what comes out of it will be one of those things that will help us to change our thinking. Dr. Norman Jacobson, the animal scientist who heads this research, tells about the project. Well, we have done much of our work with calves and goats. We are also using rabbits and rats. Uh, here's one of our goats. Uh, we give these goats milk. To the milk we add uh, fats or cholesterol or other things. Uh, so that we can tell the effect upon uh, their well-being, uh, upon the blood cholesterol level, upon uh, atherosclerosis, and perhaps coronary heart disease. Here's some pure cholesterol. We add that to some of our raisins. And here we're taking a sample of blood from the jugular vein of one of the goats for analysis in the laboratory. After the sample is taken, it's uh, brought to the laboratory for analysis. We, of course, take samples from many different goats and bring them in here and run them all at the same time. Uh, we are interested in the cholesterol levels in the blood as well as the levels of 
a number of other components of the blood. We, uh, insofar as cholesterol is concerned, we are interested in the rather long-term changes that take place in the blood as a result of uh, dietary changes that we make and certain other changes such as uh, exercise, so forth. This is uh, part of the analytical process in determining the cholesterol in the blood. We also make other measurements on the animals, such as uh, blood pressure, uh, electrocardiogram, which is being to be measured here for this uh, goat. We do this uh, preceding and following exercise and uh, in relation to other types of treatments which we impose upon the animal. Here's a young goat being brought up to the treadmill for exercising. Some of our goats are exercised vigorously twice a day. And we are determining the effect of this vigorous exercise upon the health of the heart and blood vessels, trying to determine whether this uh, has any effect upon the likelihood of cardiovascular difficulties or uh, heart disease in these animals. Here is a uh, picture of the heart. The uh, bright lines you see there are the major blood vessels or the coronary arteries. Our interest with this is to determine whether exercise will increase the amount of circulation, the number of small blood vessels, if you will, going to various parts of the heart so that perhaps if one of these blood vessels becomes stopped by a clot, uh, the blood to that area can be supplied through other vessels and that part of the heart would not die and the patient hopefully would not die. Here we have the a picture of the internal surface of a large blood vessel, the aorta of a goat uh, in the center or midline of this vessel to the right shown by the arrow is a large raised area which is referred to as a plaque but anyway uh, this is an caused by an accumulation of fatty material uh, underneath the surface uh, the inner surface of this blood vessel it tends to restrict blood flow through the area but if this sort of thing does happen in the arteries of the heart those that I showed you just a moment ago uh, it could cause death by a coronary heart attack resulting from a formation of clot there and a complete occlusion of the blood vessel. Much of the research of this project is related to saturated fat versus unsaturated fat. As you know, animal fats are mostly saturated while vegetable fats are mostly unsaturated. Some have recommended switching from saturated to the unsaturated. In fact, this is being done now in some animal feeds, hoping to increase the unsaturation of milk, meat, and fat. But Dr. Jacobson doesn't go along with this type of feeding. I think observed things which would cause us to be very cautious in major manipulations of this kind. To be specific, let me give one example. We have noticed, noticed that when we feed to some of our experimental animals, calves in this case, uh, tallow in a milk and uh, soybean oil which is relatively unsaturated the blood level of cholesterol is higher when we feed tallow than when we feed soybean oil this is true at a high level of fat feeding but when we lower the level of fat feeding to something which is more would be more modest as far as our diets are concerned then the situation reverses, and the animal that gets the unsaturated fat has the highest cholesterol level in the blood. In both of our experiments, the animals that were fed the unsaturated fat had higher levels of cholesterol in other tissues of the body, such as muscle, liver, fat, 
and so forth. The question being, is it better to have cholesterol in your tissues other than the blood or to have it in the blood? Uh, I'm not sure that we gain anything by shifting it from one tissue to another. We may create problems greater than the problem that we're trying to resolve. Moderation is probably a better approach to re reducing our uh, coronary heart disease problem than any drastic uh, change in uh, food consumption habits, uh, at least uh, on a general population basis. And so the great nutrition story has to unravel piece by piece. Not everyone is in agreement clear across the board. But one thing these doctors, nutritionists, and scientists do seem to agree on is that moderation in our diet is important. And that means, among other things, paying attention to the amount of calories we consume. How many do we need? Well, that depends a great deal on your age and stage in life. When you're just a toddler, and even though you're growing rapidly and burning up a lot of energy, you don't need as many calories to keep you going. But as you keep growing, your calorie needs increase too. And they pretty well peak out at that most active time of your life and when your body has reached its full stature. From there on, everything is downhill calorie-wise. You've grown as much as you're going to grow, except perhaps out. And many of us do just that. We keep filling up our plates just like we did when we were teenagers. Let's look at the typical day's meals that we might have been eating during those peak years of our lives. Doesn't look like much, does it? yet it adds up to 3,000 calories altogether. Now that's great for an active teenager, but not for most of us in our 40s, 50s, or 60s. Let's see how a nutritionist would cut the calories here. Cutting down on the fats and sweets would be the best way. For instance, as we look at this breakfast, we'd start with the fried eggs and bacon since they're the highest in fat. Or we might use just one egg, but poached, not fried. But instead, we're going to change from the bacon and eggs to just a plain bowl of cereal. And then since the sweets are highly caloric, we'll take off that jelly-laden toast and have just plain toast instead. Milk is important at any age, but rather than drinking it for breakfast, we'll use just this milk on the cereal. It adds the protein that we need, and definitely no cream or half and half. That would be adding more unwanted fat to the meal. And here's our breakfast, cut almost in half calorie-wise, yet adequate from the nutritional standpoint. A mid-morning snack is common too, but a rich gooey roll is too caloric for the past 40 set. Far fewer calories and far more nutritious would be something like fruit and perhaps crackers and cheese. Now what about lunch? A ham sandwich and chips, peaches and a brownie and milk. Here again, we can cut calories by taking out part of the fatty food, starting with the sandwich. We'll use only a third as much spread on the bread this time. And then we'll make sure that only lean meat goes in between. All of the visible fat on the meat has been cut out. Now from the outside, you can't tell we've cut the calories on this sandwich at all, but we definitely have. And we've taken the potato chips off. They soak up a lot of fat in cooking, so in their place we're going to put a variety of crisp and colorful fresh vegetables. They're low in calories, but rich in vitamins and minerals. In other words, we're dropping calories, but gaining nutrients. Most brownies are notably high in fat, so we'll take the brownie off and replace it with a couple of sugar cookies. They're made with far less shortening. This milk is whole milk. If we're going to stick to the idea of cutting down on the amount of fat, we'll change from whole to skim milk. Now dinner. It's high in calories too, but a few changes will cut those down considerably. Let's start by cutting down on the amount of meat. We don't need that much since we had meat in our sandwich at noon. And we're going to take off the mashed potatoes and gravy. It's the gravy that's loaded with calories, not the potato. So we'll keep the potato, but in a different form, a parsley buttered potato. Far lower in calorie count than those smothered with gravy. Now the roll with its spreads. First we'll use only half as much of the fat spread. And since jelly has only calories, no nutrients, we'll eliminate that as well. 
As for the salad, it's the dressing that adds unwanted calories here, so learning to eat salads without dressing is really the best idea. Greens are especially low in calories. However, if dressing is an absolute must, then stick to the low calorie type. And even then, we'd use it sparingly. Just one or two teaspoons at the most. That's really all that's needed for flavor. Now here's a real challenge, to resist a hot fudge sundae. We can have a sundae for dessert, but topped with chocolate is too caloric. Any fresh fruit in season will have far less calories and be better for us in the long run. And here's our dinner now, with just taking out part of the fats and sweets, we've cut out more than 400 calories. Let's look again at the total day, at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and the snack. With just a few simple changes, we've gone from 3,000 calories down to 1,800. Yet you can hardly notice any difference in the amount of food dished up. But you will notice the difference when it comes to holding your weight down. And you'll feel a lot better, too. But suppose you eat out a lot. That's not a problem, either. Most good restaurants have a menu that features meat, a vegetable, salad, and your choice of drink. And some are cutting out dessert completely or serving just a light sherbet or ice cream. And fresh vegetables and fruits are being featured more and more in restaurant salads today. They're low in calories if you eat them just as they are. So skip the dressing. That's where the high calorie count comes in. Remember in a restaurant, too, the choices you make are your own. You're the boss over every mouthful you swallow. You do have a lot to say about your own future, your own health, by the foods you select to eat. And the wisest choices are those foods that nutritionists call the four food groups. A wide variety of uh, fruits and vegetables can be consumed in the bread group, bread, macaroni, spaghetti, uh, grains such as rice, and the cereals, crackers, and so on. In the dairy group, a wide variety of things with the preference for low-fat products kept in mind. In the meat group, good lean red meats, the fish, the poultry, uh, the eggs within the limit of four per week, and the meat alternates such as beans. And what about taking extra vitamins? Well, let your doctor guide you here. There may be times in your life when it's necessary, but not often. But for suggestions in good eating for the second half of your life, turn to the nutrition section of your guidebook. This guidebook I have here. If you don't have your copy yet, well, drop a card to this station. There's no charge for the book, and watch for recommendations from our nutrition experts. Moderation in diet is the key. My own feeling is that the best way to go would be to make the smallest changes consistent with better health because I uh, slogan is moderation, but not martyrdom. This should all be done in moderation while enjoying a variety of foods and maintaining a well-balanced diet. Moderation is probably a better approach to reducing our uh, coronary heart disease problem than any drastic uh, change in uh, food consumption habits. So to improve our chances of having a long and vigorous life, let's stick to the four food groups in moderation for the second half of our life.